Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session of Pocket Chat, supporting the Chicago Bar Association and the Chicago Bar Foundation's Sustainable Practice of Law and Innovations Recommendations. I'm Lynn Grayson. I'm one of the co-chairs for the task force and currently the CBA First Vice President, along with my fellow co-chair, Justice Marianne Mason. We're so happy to have Trish Rich joining us today. Trish is the chair of the Modernizing Law Referral and Law Firm Models Committee of the Task Force, and one of my favorite attorneys in Illinois, and <laughs> one of the best known and highly regarded professional responsibility lawyers, um, both in Illinois and, and in the United States. Trish is a partner at Holland and Knight, where she co-chairs the legal profession team and is a member of the litigation and dispute resolution practice. During this chat, we're going to discuss recommendation number one, which is recognize a new intermediary entity model to help connect lawyers with legal consumers. This recommendation was put forth by Trisha's committee, the Modernizing Lawyer Referral Committee, which is comprised of legal professionals who work in a variety of practice settings and represent a variety of viewpoints. Trish, with that background, can you give us kind of an overview of what's going on and, and what the problem is that prompted this recommendation? Well, um, thanks, Lynn. Thanks for having me today. And um, thank you for that introduction. You're, you're too kind. Um, but uh, it's been my a real, real pleasure to work on this committee chaired by you and Justice Mason. Um, and, you know, largely supported by Bob Blades and Jess Bednar. It's, it's just been a, a great team to work with. So thank you for having me and thank you for including me in this very important project. Um, so really, um, as you already mentioned, my, my committee, my subcommittee in particular was you know, modernizing law firms and legal systems. And what we were really trying to do is get to a place where um, our, uh, the way that people find lawyers and the way that lawyers find clients works more efficiently. Um, what we generally think of when in the legal profession field, when we're talking about this, is that it's sort of a classic market failure because we have a system right now that's full of lawyers. I mean, we have more lawyers in Illinois than we have ever had at any point in time before. Um, and then we also have at the same time an increasingly um, you know, large number of low and middle income clients who can't um, afford legal help, can't find a lawyer, or in many, many, many cases can't even really clearly identify that they have a legal problem that needs help. We also know um, that when litigants are represented by lawyers, they have better outcomes. For example, in a mortgage foreclosure case, you are more than twice as likely to lose your house if you're not represented by counsel. Um, for victims of domestic violence who are trying to seek PPOs, they are over 50% less likely to get one if they do not have a lawyer. And we see um, not only in our court, but in courts across in, in states, courts in states across the country, up to 90% of individual litigants are showing up in court houses um, without counsel. And this is especially true in both the housing cases and in family court, which is also the place where individual litigants are most likely to encounter the legal system. So what we end up having is lawyers who, you know, are trying to build their businesses and can't always effectively access clients and a bunch of clients who can't for some reason or another get legal help. Um, and uh, when I am working with lawyers and law firms, one of the things I, I would say over and over again, so if you've ever been to one of my CLE programs, you've probably heard me say this, is that the practice of law when you are a solo or a small firm lawyer is really two full-time jobs. It is the job of being a lawyer, which is the thing that we went to law school to do. And then it is also the job of running a business. And Lynn, I, I know that I don't have to tell you that as you know, a, a small firm yourself, but um, it's, it's the marketing, it's the advertising, it is all of the things that go into that. And it's also the, you know, the hustle of getting clients and uh, because we have a very complex system of professional responsibility rules that also try to do two things, right? Our rules of professional conduct are not only the ethical code that we 
um, have as attorneys, which say, you know, you, you can't lie, you can't cheat, you can't steal. They also you regulate stole that from me, Trish. <laughs> <laughs> I hope nobody's hearing that for the first time, right? <laughs> um, they, so it, it forms the, the ethics of what we do, but it also regulates the profession in a way that isn't based in ethics or morality, but rather just like how we interact with each other, how we interact with the courts, the bar, and our clients, right? So anyway, one of the um, things that the, the Code of Conduct gives us is that it um, regulates how we can um, find clients and how we can pay for finding clients. And uh, in what is clearly a very classic market failure, um, my committee set out you know, to figure out a way that we could do that a little bit better. So it could better serve clients and better serve attorneys. I, I wish I could have done that in a shorter period of time, that I, but I don't know that I could have. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You know what, that, that was perfect. It's interesting, the, the one takeaway I had from your committee, and it was a pleasure to be a member of your committee, is this, when I think about this topic particularly, it dawns on me that what the committee has recommended and what we're trying to do and what the recommendation that we're proposing to the Illinois Supreme Court, from my perspective, is really a win-win. As you mm -hmm. pointed out, you've got individuals and organizations in need of legal services, and you've got lawyers in Illinois, correctly so, more so now than ever, that are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to connect with clients that need their services and struggling to have a sustainable law practice. And I think some of the regulatories were, regulatory reform that we're talking about, and particularly this recommendation in particular, I think um, can't help but be a win-win situation. And I'm very hopeful that our Illinois Supreme Court will, will adopt it. Can you explain a little bit more um, so that we better understand how this recommendation would change circumstances and what's it, what is it intended to do? Sure. So I'll start by saying, you know, the big concern, right? Um, and, and I'll be honest, there are people that do not think this should change. The big concern is whether or not lawyers can maintain their professional independence once you start adding other people into the mix. Um, I personally don't think that that is um, as big of a, a concern as I, I think some people would make it out to be. Frankly, we deal with um, service providers all of the time, and um, we, I, I don't think there are lots of concerns about our professional independence, and I can tell on, you know, dealing with a lot of lawyers and law firms who get into trouble for things, that is not a thing people get into trouble for a lot. Um, but really what the proposal is intended to do is clarify that as long as lawyers can keep that professional independence piece um, and not be answering really to anybody but their client and maybe the court, if it's a, if it's a court proceeding, um, that we would find a way to improve and expand the way that lawyers and clients can be matched up together and help lawyers on uh, access other, um, uh, uh, other and better methods to deal with things like the business of their law firm, the technology of their law firm, the administrative services of their law firm. Um, you know, right now, I think that people don't realize that some of the regulations would prevent, for instance, um, you using an accounting service that would uh, charge you a base, like a, a percentage of your revenue of your law firm, right? And that's, you know, one way that some accounting or fee services work. Our regulations prohibit that in a lot of places. So um, even something as simple, like a law firm, you know, renting space or subletting its own space and like, you know, paying a lease that is, you know, based on, on revenue. There are lots of places where um, the business of law is treated a little bit differently than that of other professionals because of the regulations that we alone have. So, you know, on that point, um, you're absolutely right. After 25 years in big law and now um, being at my own shop and at a small boutique law firm, as you point out, Trish, I have all those services. You know, I have IT services. We have right. technology services. We have all of the various services, but we contract with them individually. And so there's a a myriad of services that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis to provide us what we need 
to conduct, as you point out, the, the business of law, it just seems to me that there's perhaps a more efficient way to do it. I feel like we've mastered it pretty efficiently, just given the nature of our practice. Um, but I think that there are certain practices that are incredibly challenged, particularly if you're a solo practitioner, mm -hmm. particularly challenged just to um, not only find the clients, get the work done, but get the bills out the door so that you right. can keep your lights on. I think that that's a, a tremendous issue and one that other industries and other sectors have addressed effectively, but I'm not sure that, that lawyers have. Can you talk? <laughs> Go ahead. It is two full-time jobs. I mean, it really is. And one of the things we're seeing more and more is law students coming out and starting their own law firms. And so right away, we have people that, that come out, try to start their own firms, have not really practiced before, and are thrust into two full-time jobs. Add to that that very, very few law students um, came from business backgrounds. Very, something like 8% of them had business degrees. Right. So you're getting people like me, right? I have two philosophy degrees. I come, <laughs> you know, um, we are not always the best equipped to run businesses. The skill sets that um, help us be good lawyers are not always the skill sets that help us be good business people. And as you know, I am the walking uh, uh, stereotype of the lawyer that's bad at math. And I think there are lots of me though, right? And so um, it's tough to try to, to, try to uh, manage both of those things. Um, but yeah, so I think our proposal is intended to recognize, you know, the, the meat of the proposal is to modify rule 5.4 to recognize and allow intermediary entities um, that would allow uh, lawyers and clients to have somebody between them that, for, for example, would match them up in a client matching um, scheme or, uh, or other things, like some of the other things we've talked about, but you know, that's one example. And um, the proposal also includes um, registration requirements of intermediary uh, matching services that would allow you know, the Supreme Court or some other body to monitor them and make sure that what they were doing was, um, you know, within the bounds of what we would expect in our profession. Um, and really, very importantly, it would um, uh, modify the way that um, we apply our, our confidentiality, our privilege requirements to uh, uh, in that in-between stage where, um, because as, as you I'm sure know, and as a lot of the people that will watch us will know, you know, attorney-client privilege can be broken if there's a third person. And so we want to make right. it clear that having mm -hmm. a third person in there does not break that privilege. So the meat of the proposal we've made um, does those, you know, few things. Can you give us, Trish, an example, um, maybe something from another business sector of how this might look in law or how we could think about this? Sure. Yeah, there are lots of examples from other professions. Um, Aspen Dental is one we've talked about a lot inside of our, inside of our um, committee. And what Aspen Dental does is it is basically um, a company that, that does uh, what uh, one of my clients calls the back office part of being a dental service, right? They are um, doing marketing, they're doing scheduling, they're doing payroll, they're doing back offices for the, the business part of being a dentist office. And the dentist office that work with Aspen Dental then get to do the dentist part of being a dental office. Um, and there's no reason to think, uh, first of all, we haven't seen any other professions that have this sort of, um, you know, in what is more or less all other professions, frankly, that are regulated, that have this sort of um, platform, we don't, we don't see the concerns of, you know, professional independence being impeded. But what we do see is efficiency, right? For all of the reasons I said that lawyers are not always great business people, being able to outsource that part of our business to somebody else um, seems like it would be a very valuable thing for lots of people, particularly solos and small firms. I, I absolutely agree. Um, Trish, what else would you like to share? Or what else would you like to say about the recommendations from your committee and this important proposal to the Illinois Supreme Court? Any final thoughts? 
Yeah, um, you know, my committee, um, I was blessed to work with a very, very great committee um, in all of the committees. I mean, when I was first approached to, to um, sit on this task force, the reason I did it was because I looked at who else was doing it and I was like, you know, all these great people, all my friends, these people I like and respect, you know, are working on what I think is a really important project. And I said in the beginning to Bob Waves, I said, it's very ambitious, but if we can do this, it will change the way that we practice law in Illinois you know, in a really, really good way. And so um, I, it was a lot of work and I'm extraordinarily grateful to the people on my committee and all of the committees that serve. Um, and it gave me a great chance to work with some of my favorite people in the practice. Um, which was great, but it's it's just it's something I hope that everybody can look at with an open mind. Um, you know, the worst reason to continue to do things is just because it, we're familiar with it or because we've always done it that way. And so some of these changes are a little bit scary. Um, and I hope that people can get over sort of that initial like we've never done it this way before, um, because it's just that's a terrible reason to keep doing something <laughs> the same way. Um, and that is what we would tell our clients. We're a self-regulated profession, and that's a heavy burden, but it means it's something we have to take, you know, it's a, it's a responsibility we have to take very responsibly and seriously, and um, think about really what's best for the legal profession as a whole, and that includes our clients, the courts, and everybody, and should not include, frankly, an element of protectionism of, of the law. I mean, that is not what our regulatory duties are. So, um, that is, uh, I think, all I probably have to say. So uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here. Very good. Um, Trish, thank you so much for being a part of this today. On behalf of the Chicago Bar Association and the Chicago Bar Foundation, we'd like to thank everyone for viewing this pocket chat and your interest in the work of the task force. Please visit the Chicago Bar Foundation website at chicagobarfoundation.org to learn more about the final report and the recommendations that we plan to submit to the Supreme Court later this year in September. We invite you to view additional pocket chats related to the task force recommendations, also available at the Chicago Bar Foundation website, and share your thoughts and feedback with us during the upcoming public comment period. We look forward to your participation. Trish, thanks again. We really appreciate it, all you've done you. um, and your leadership. Take care. Thank you, and thanks to Justice Mason. It's been, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.